Uh, our scripture reading for the day is in Jeremiah 1, but I'm going to be using Jeremiah as a launching pad for the message out of the book of Esther. So you can be finding your place in both places, Jeremiah 1 and Esther chapter 4. And so um, who wants to volunteer? A couple of you, you, uh, you students who are going to be going to school to read a few verses. I've got four verses to read. Come on up here and, and stand up here. I'll have, I have the Bible right here for you to read. Uh, church, if you don't have a Bible, you don't um, open up your Bible, it's in your bulletin as well. These, these verses should be in your bulletin. I think my mic is having a little bit of issues here going in and out. Am I on? Okay. All right. So come on up here and let's read these verses to start out, and then we're going to launch into the message. All right, so Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 8 are what we're going to read. It starts right there. Read into the mic and let them hear. So you can read uh, like verse uh, 4 and 5, and then Emma, you can read 6 and uh, 7, or, and then you can read verse 8. Does that sound good? Okay. The word of the Lord came to me. I chose you before I formed. Keep, uh, yeah, so keep. I chose you before I formed you in the womb. I set you apart before you were born. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. But I protested, oh no, oh no, Lord God, look, I don't know how to speak since I am only a youth. And then Alexis, read the last couple right there. Do not be afraid of anyone, for I will be with you to rescue you. This is the Lord's declaration. All right, so... Using that special set of verses to make the point that before, and, and what the, the Bible says about the prophet Jeremiah, before he was formed in his womb, God knew him. God set him apart. God had chosen him for a specific purpose and the specific time in which Jeremiah would minister to the people of Judah and be their prophet and lead them in a time that was desperate, in a time of hardship, in a time Jeremiah is uh, become known as the weeping prophet. And God knew exactly what the people, what his people would need during the time in which he formed Jeremiah in his mother's womb and placed that special calling on him. We see that throughout the Bible, and I chose that verse to sort of be a springboard, if you will, or a launching into this message because it parallels so closely with the specific calling and the specific time and place in which God had placed Esther in the book of Esther and the story that we see in her life. So I want to start the very next slide I have on the the PowerPoint or, or slideshow is a video, and I want to start with this video. I know we have some kids in the service. Normally, we have kids zone going on. So the video is an animated video, and look at the life of Esther to give you a, a brief overview, because I'm going to be up here boring you for the next 15 minutes, giving you a whole lot of details, and these animated uh, cartoonists have done a really good job, I think, in, in making it relevant for, for you guys to learn the, the gist of the story and get an idea bef- uh, uh, for some of the background. So, guys, if you want to go to the next slide, enjoy the video, and, uh, and I'll be right up afterwards. It's time for a Bible story. A long time ago, there was a woman named Esther who lived in the land of Persia. Oh, that's where all those fancy rugs come from, right? <laughs> yeah. Those are nice. Little pricey, though. God had an amazing plan for Esther's life. She would be remembered forever as a hero. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Super Esther. What does she do? Save the planet from a meteor? Nope. Did she rescue a million kittens from a tree? No. Did she carry a bomb out of Gotham City on the Batwing so everyone wouldn't blow up, but you're not sure for like five minutes if she made it or not? No, that's Batman. Come on. Right, right. Still gets me every time. Esther did something even more amazing than all of those things, and it sure took a lot of guts to do it. All right, lay it on me. What's the sitch? Well, first of all, Esther and her family were Jewish, which was kind of a big deal back then in Persia. Uh, what do you mean? Well, at the time, the Jewish people weren't really liked by the Persians. 
In fact, they had to live in exile, and they weren't treated very well at all. Yikes, that's no good. Esther was also an orphan, and she lived with her cousin Mordecai, who protected and raised her after her parents died. Sweet beard, bruh. Then one day, something happened that would change Esther's life big time. The king of Persia wanted to find a new wife, so he put on a huge beauty pageant where the winner would become the queen. Wait, really? That's a pretty weird way to get hitched. Like, congratulations, you're the new Miss America, and we're married. Well, as weird as it may sound, that's what the king wanted to do, so that's what happened. Women from all over the kingdom were there, but there was only one that the king favored. Paula Dean. What? Yeah, think about it. He would eat like a king. Well, I mean, I guess he's already a king, but think about how awesome every meal would be. Breakfast, bacon. Lunch, biscuits and gravy. Dinner, butter bacon biscuits with a side of butter. Come on, Paula Dean wasn't around then. This happened like thousands of years ago. Esther was very beautiful and God gave her favor in the king's eyes. So just like that, she won the pageant. Wait, so Esther became the queen of Persia? Yeah. Okay, that's cool and all, but didn't you say that Esther was Jewish and that like the Persians didn't like Jewish people? That's true, but the king didn't know that Esther was Jewish. She didn't want him to find out because she didn't know what would happen to her. So she kept it a secret and never brought it up. Okay, so like now she's the queen. Crazy. Is that it? No way. This is where the story really picks up. There's another guy that works for the king named Haman, and he's a pretty bad dude. He hates the Jewish people so much so that he actually brings an idea to the king that would be terrible to kill all of the Jewish people. Whoa, that's really rough. Like, surely the king doesn't go through with it, right? Actually, Haman gets the king to agree and sets the plan in motion. Wait, but if all the Jewish people are killed, that would be horrible. They're like God's chosen people, aren't they? And that's where Jesus would eventually come from. This can't happen. Somebody's got to do something. And that's where Esther comes in. She can't stand the thought of seeing her people get wiped out by Haman's awful plan, but she doesn't know what to do. I know what she should do. Time to lay down the law and tell the king not to do it. She probably kicked into mama bear mode and was all like, listen here, buddy. Uh, let me stop you right there. Keep in mind that this is like ancient Persia. You couldn't just approach the king whenever you wanted to, even if you had a reason. Anytime someone would just pop off to the king, they'd usually get a pop off themselves. Ah, gotcha. So I guess she's in a pretty tough spot, huh? Totally. On one hand, she didn't want to see her people destroyed, but on the other hand, she can't just walk up to the king and tell him what to do. Even the queen? Nope. Nobody could just walk up and talk to the king, period. Man, this is tough stuff. So what'd she do? Even though her mind was filled with doubt and worry about what would happen to her, she had to do something. Esther knew that no matter what her feelings were telling her, she was a child of God. She knew that God loved her and that he had blessed her life and that if she stood up for God's people, that God would back her up. Yeah, that's right. You go, Esther. Esther trusted God and boldly went before the king. The nobles and the guards that surrounded him couldn't believe what they were seeing. Who did this woman think she was that she could just walk up to the king on her own? Oh man, I bet her feelings were totally freaking out. I'm sure she was feeling a lot of things. She asked the king if she could make a request and to everyone's surprise, the king wasn't upset. He didn't call for her to be taken away by the guards or thrown in jail, but instead he listened. Whew, that was intense. Okay, he's listening, time to land the plane. But she couldn't do it. What? She chickened out? Bummer. No, not exactly. She didn't want to come right out and tell the king everything, so she asked to have a banquet and planned to tell him there. Okay, so there's still a chance to save her people. Come on, Esther, you can do it. Later at the banquet, she went before the king with another request. All right, here we go. Showtime. But she was still too nervous. Goodness gracious, you weren't kidding when you said her feelings were freaking out. Totally. She was feeling all kinds of things, even questioning if the whole thing was a mistake. But her cousin Mordecai encouraged her and reminded her that what God says is more important than her fears and doubts, and he told her something that she would never forget. Esther, you were put here for such a time as this. Yeah, come on, Esther, you got this. Esther had dinner with the king again, and the moment came for her to ask her question. She took a deep breath, and she went for it. She pleaded with him not to go through with Haman's plan to kill the Jews. 
she finally told him that she was Jewish herself, and if Haman's plan goes through, that she would have to die too. Man, Esther is one tough cookie. What happened next? The king was moved by Esther's request and agreed to what she asked. He immediately got rid of Haman and canceled the plan to wipe out the Jewish people. Yeah, you did it, Esther. The king also gave all of Haman's wealth and property to Esther and Mordecai. Not only that, but the king signed a new decree to protect the Jewish people and keep them safe. The people of Israel were saved! Man, Esther is like a real-life superhero. Move over, Wonder Woman. Esther can take you any day. <laughs> Esther decided to put her trust in who God said she was more than what she felt. And because of that, her entire country was saved. The end. I thought that would I thought that video when I saw that would did a better job at telling the story than I would ever be able to do standing up here boring you all to death with a bunch of details you probably didn't need. Um, I certainly couldn't be as fun and fancy. Um, today it's a simple message. Es Alexis is gonna like this one. God has a plan. God has a plan. <laughs> uh, it's a it's an inside joke that we've been <laughs> going back and forth about. It's pretty funny. Um, but nonetheless, God has a plan. God has a purpose for your life. And like with the prophet Jeremiah, in the same way with Esther, he called her, he formed her through a series of circumstances. He placed her in exactly where she needed to be with the gifts and the courage and the abilities to do what he had called her to do. God has a plan. Esther chapter 4, verses 14 to 17 are where I find the key verses where Mordecai says to Esther, if you keep silent at this time, and deliverance, uh, relief and deliverance will come to the Jewish people from another place. But you and, your families, uh, you and your father's family will be destroyed. Who knows, perhaps you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Esther sent a reply to Mordecai, Go and assemble all the Jews who can be found in Susa and fast for me. Don't eat or drink for three days, night or day, and I and my female servants will also fast in the same way. After that, I will go to the king, even if it is against the law. If I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went and did everything Esther commanded him. This morning, I just want to pull out what I'm calling two big truths uh, that show how God selected Esther for a particular place in a particular time to fulfill a particular purpose, and, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll pull from it some applications for us. So let's go to God in prayer uh, for this message. God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for those who are here gathered with us, both here in person, those who are viewing online. And, and God, I pray right now that you will remove me from this stage and that you would speak, God, that your word would be magnified, that Jesus Christ would be exalted and lifted up, and that in some way, God, you have chosen in your plan to use me at this day and this hour to bring this message. And I pray that it will not fall on deaf ears, but instead, God, as your word, as we look at your word and the truths from your word that we can find in the story of Esther, you'll help us to, 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 to make some decisions, God, to, to follow you more closely and to seek what it is that you have called us to do in this world. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Two big truths stand out throughout the book of Esther and her life. And I say truth number one is this. I'll start out. God has a plan and is at work even when we can't see him. God has a plan and is at work even when we can't see him. The book of Esther is 10 chapters long, 170-something verses, I believe. And in the entire book of Esther, you cannot find the name of God. God is not there. It looks and it appears as if God is absent. But throughout the pages of Esther, if you're reading, even though you can't see the name of God, you don't see a reference to God specifically from any of the characters. You see many characters and different people doing different things, but you don't see God. 
But it's very easy if you look. You can see his hand at work. And so I want to start out simply with this, that no matter what you're going through, no matter how difficult or dark the day, even if it seems that God is nowhere to be found, he's there and he is at work. This is a truth that we see throughout Scripture, and, and, and it's pretty cool um, practice or thing if you want to maybe do for your devotions uh, at some point. I would, I would recommend look and read through the book of Esther with that specific purpose in mind. Where is God at work? Read through it. Study it on your own, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, so that you can look for God's unseen hand at work, even though it's not uh, made clear on uh, the surface. Sometimes it's hard to trust God. Sometimes it's hard to, to move forward in life and to do what we think God might be calling us to do, because sometimes we don't even know that we can see that God is even around at all. I'm sure Mordecai felt like this when he saw such a wicked man, Haman, being promoted and prospered in chapter 3. Verses 1 through 7, if you want to flip there. It says, after all this took place, speaking of the beauty pageant and the, things that, uh, uh, the circumstances that led to Esther being in the, the, the palace, it's been now a few years after all of this took place. And it says, King Ahasuerus honored Haman, the son of Hamedatha, the Agag who were people who were enemies of God and you could look back into Exodus and see some references to them that there's a history there where the Jewish people would have been certainly enemies to the um, Agagites and those people um, and it says that the king promoted him in rank and gave him a higher position than all the other officials the evil man with evil intentions and evil motives is being prospered is succeeding and it says that the entire royal staff at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman because the king had commanded this to be done. But Mordecai would not bow down, the Bible says. Mordecai would not pay homage. The members of the royal staff at the king's gate asked Mordecai, why are you disobeying the king's command? And when they had warned him day after day, and he still would not listen to them, it says they told Haman in order to see if Mordecai's actions would be tolerated by him. And since he told them that he was a Jew. And verse number five says, when Haman saw that Mordecai was not bowing down, so Haman passes by, sees that he's not bowing down, not paying him homage, Haman was filled with rage. And when it was learned, or when he learned of Mordecai's ethnic identity, when he learned of Mordecai's race, it says that he was, it says it seemed repugnant to Haman to do away with Mordecai alone, so he planned to destroy all of Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout Ahasuerus' kingdom. In those verses, we don't really see God at work. If we look at the surface, we can't see that God is working. To the contrary, what we see is an evil man being promoted and everybody around him thinking he's the best thing ever. They're praising him, they're honoring him, they're having parades for him, and they're bowing down to him. And Mordecai, Esther's cousin, is now being persecuted for refusing to go along with the crowd and bow down and pay honor to Haman. And in those verses, we can see evil prospering. We see an evil man succeeding. We see how prideful he is, Haman, how angry he became. And then we see that when he learned of Mordecai's race, how racist he was. And he decided there is no way that I should just punish Mordecai. I'm going to punish all of Mordecai's people. We're going to wipe them off the face of the earth. Haman was a Jew hater with a burning passion to be exalted higher than everybody else. And actually, it's this combination of traits in him that actually ultimately lead to his downfall and destruction at the end of the book. Haman almost succeeded in his plan to destroy the Jews out of his world. 
But it was Esther who God chose to use to save them from that fate. Sometimes it might look like evil's winning. It might seem that God is not at work doing anything. I'm reminded of Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good to those who are called and to those who are living according to his purpose, to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. All things during difficult times, during hard times, in such a time as this that we live in 2020 with, in, in right now, all things, yeah, the crazy stuff that's on the news right now, all things, the, the, the new society and new life that I'm having to somehow get adjusted to, all things work together for good. Somehow, some way, even if I can't see the hand of God at work, the challenge for us is to trust that God is still in control and that God is still working. It's a huge truth in the book of Esther and throughout all of Scripture. The idea of the sovereignty of God and how God is still in control of the affairs of men. And yet somehow there's also within God's sovereignty framework, he permits and allows you and I to make our own choices. Even sometimes choosing not to do what God would in essence want us to do. And so we act within the boundaries of his sovereignty to go out and make choices that may or may not be good choices. And even still, when some people who are bad people do bad things and bad things happen in our lives, we don't know why and we can't understand it a lot of times, but we've got to trust the unseen hand sometimes. In, in, in early... 2019, Abby and I met with a realtor in Ocala, and we had made the decision that we were going to sell our house. And uh, leading up to that, a whole lot of different events and things that we had been praying about, specific things, we were asking God for clarity. What was our future? Where were we going? How were we going to be used by him? And, and all sorts of things. And we met with the realtor, and we did so hoping and trusting that we're going to be able to sell the house at a, at a decent price, or we're going to be able to have it ready to be sold when we needed to sell it. We didn't know how long it was going to be. We didn't know what God was planning. We didn't know how he was orchestrating or moving, because sometimes it just, quite frankly, wasn't easy to see. There was a lot of things that were not clear in our lives uh, during that, that phase of our life and that, that period of time in the year or so that, it, that it, it took for us as we were pursuing what God wanted for him to reveal it and make it known to us. And so we had no idea how long it was going to be, the house is going to be on the market, is it going to sell, are we going to get a buyer, all these different things. And, and this is, the, uh, so I'll let you know, so this is like June of 2019, this is uh, the day before is when but the day before we were traveling down here to come to this church for the very first time to, to, to Canada and to meet you guys and to just have a weekend that we had a great time with you. Um, but as we were in the preparations for doing this, the house, we, we listed it on the market the day before we left. We had no idea if we were going to come down here and you guys were just going to hate us. <laughs> and we had no idea if we were going to come down here and we were just going to hate you. I don't know. <laughs> um, so, but nonetheless, we knew that somehow God was working and we were going to trust him. And even still, we, we put the house on the market. That day, were, such, so many crazy things happened in our life at that time. And, and I can't go into all the details. But I will say that we were planning to leave like in the afternoon sometime. I think it was a, a, a Friday maybe. Um, and I was working in the morning. We were planning to leave and, and come down here, drive down here, pack up the bags and stuff like that. And, and the realtor, we had just you know, put the house on the market at like 10, 11 o'clock at night. The night before is when it officially went out. And then, and then the realtor calls me the next morning, and that's the morning we're getting ready to leave that afternoon. And she, she says, uh, hey, I have somebody who wants to see the house. Um, can we do 6 o'clock tonight? I said, yeah, we're going we're gonna to be on our way to Sarasota, so the house will be open. We'll leave the house ready. You've got access. You can go do it. 6 o'clock, do your thing. 
And so we're like, oh, wow, that's awesome. There was a lot of activity going on throughout uh, people looking at it, sharing it. Like I kept seeing like on Zillow, I've never done this before. It's the first home we ever uh, bought, ever, ever owned and then also sold. And so I kept seeing the, the numbers of people saving it to their profiles and stuff like that, like as a favorite house. I'm like, wow, wow, it's crazy. All the different things that are going on, the activity. The realtor called later on. She says, well, okay, I know we got that six o'clock set up, but there's a realtor out right now in the area and, and in, in about four o'clock, he wants to be at your house. Is that all right if he shows it to them? Like four o'clock is tough because we're like ready to, we're gonna be leaving in the early afternoon sometime, but I guess we'll, we'll make it happen. Uh, sure, we'll do it. Same thing, she called a third time, same day, same morning. Said, I know I've been calling you and I know you're like gonna be packing this afternoon, but if there's any way possible, and it's one o'clock right now, if there's any way possible that in the next like 30, 45 minutes, somebody can bring their client around and, and, and look at your house. Um, we don't know, you know, she's like, we don't know. You never know. So if, if it's at all possible for you to make it available um, and, and be gone by then, that'd be great. Now, now you have to understand like the Barkman household in order to get a little bit of, it, uh, of the insight here. <laughs> all right. Um, literally, like Abby and I both work that morning. We plan to be off in, uh, around noon, one o'clock, and we come home, we eat a quick lunch and like fast food or something. And and, and like Abby is, Abby's like doing laundry. <laughs> we're, we're trying to pack bags to come on this trip to get down here. We, we just got the kids and everybody, you know, we're just trying to, we're going through life. And, and we were planning on being gone, but now the time had moved a little bit sooner and moved a little bit sooner. Now, now that's really not, not a good time for us at all. Um, like at the time that I got that call, we had suitcases out on the couches and on the table in the dining room and we're you know we got baskets of clothes that are being folded and put in the suitcases to come and travel down here i mean it was absolutely hectic and crazy and 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 i'm like i don't know let me put her on hold i said abby i don't know what you think i mean maybe this who knows god who knows maybe i think if we can do it we can do it she's like yeah but we cannot be the laundry is still running i can't leave and be gone while i need the clothes that are in there to take the trip and so we're like i don't know how it's gonna happen so we said we'll just run to dunkin donuts We'll close up all the stuff that's all, that's all loose and out. We're not packed yet. We'll just throw it in the garage and hide it in the, wherever it's not going to be seen or worried about, and, and we'll just make it happen. So I said, okay, we'll do it. We're, we're backing out as they're actually like sitting there waiting for us to back out. Like they're like really in the neighborhood. Um, we're backing out. We're like, hey, and then we go on to Dunkin' Donuts, sit there for a half hour, get the, get the text that they've, they've seen the house, and we can go back. We go back. We finish. We take the trip down here. Now listen, throughout that trip down here, if you remember anything about that trip or not, if there was, there was some, 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 it was a rough journey. Well, it's just a few hour trip. It's not that difficult of a trip, but we had a tire go out before we even got out of town in Ocala. And so we had to go and stop and get the tires replaced. Uh, one of the tires replaced because I'm cheap and I did the one tire that I knew was needing the issue. And like they didn't, we, I was in a hurry. I got to Sam's right before they closed. I said, okay, let's just do it. So then we were driving and like literally like halfway down here, we're hearing the noise again. Dun, 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 and there's a different tire that's having problems. And now no tire places are open. So we're dealing with that. And we get down here, get into the hotel. It's literally on the way down here. The realtor texts and says that, um, hey, we got an offer on the house. And then she says, um, hey, we got a second offer about like later on that night. We got a second offer. So now we're having to decide like which offer is better. What are we going to do? Like all the details on that. It's like 10 o'clock at night. I'm in the hotel room here in Sarasota. And, and, I, and I signed the the, the offer um, back to them, like, and we, we agreed with them, and, and I sent it back to the realtor. And as it would turn out, coincidentally or not, that two o'clock showing happened to be the people that we saw as we were backing out were the ones who loved the house and gave us a near full price offer. Now, I don't know. No, I do know. But like, it's crazy to think like all the stuff that was going on in our life at that time and to see that even though how difficult and how challenging everything was on that trip, that God was opening, uh, opening doors and moving even when we sometimes didn't see it. Challenges, difficulties, all these things that we had a hard time seeing. Somebody said about the book of Esther, it seems odd at first glance that this book doesn't mention God. Instead, we get a series of coincidences. This Jewish woman, Esther, happens to be chosen as queen. Her relative and confidant, Mordecai, happens to overhear and foil an assassination plot against the king. 
The king happens to grant Esther permission to speak when she comes into the throne room unannounced. The king happens to have insomnia the night before Haman plots to kill Mordecai. And it just so happens that the story being read to him during his insomnia, insomnia is the story of Mordecai's her heroism earlier. Strung together like this, it is clear that the author of the book of Esther is not noting random coincidences, they said, but is instead demonstrating that God is at work even in things that seem random. Trust the unseen hand. Look for what God might be doing in your life when you have no idea what's going on. The Old Testament is filled with people, Abraham, people like David and Goliath, people like Moses who just followed and did what God wanted him to do even though he had doubts and struggles and fears that he wasn't capable and that this wasn't a good idea. The three Hebrew children who choose to stand up and do what God asked them to do even though everybody else was bowing down. Normal people, n all of them known now, well-known people. But before they chose to act in faith, before they chose to go and do what God called them to do, they were not known. But they were known to God. They were known to a God who loved them and who had a plan for their lives, and they chose to follow and pursue him with everything they had. That's big truth number one. Big truth number two, the last thing. You are part of God's plan and this is your time. You are part of God's plan. Every single person listening to me is part of God's plan. And God, for some reason, in his plan, has chosen this time for you to live. Have you ever thought, like, why now? Like, first of all, why me? Like, why would you make me come into the world at the time that you came into the world? But your birthday is your birthday. And it's your birthday for a reason. And he's got a plan for you to impact the world that you're born into. 2020? Like, have you seen the news? Like, really? Coronavirus, pandemics, craziness, chaos. Not only that, now, guys and girls... This is your time in school, the school that you're going to. It's the school that God has planned for you to go to, and you are to be a light in that place. This is your time. No matter what, God wants you there for a purpose. He's got you there for a purpose. In, in the beginning of Esther, the first couple chapters, we see craziness happening in Esther's story. And if you go and study it, you'll be able to see it. But it was a messed up culture that she was living in. It was a messed up culture that she was wrapped up in. A very broken society with so many immoral and ungodly practices going on. Going on. Listen, Esther was an orphan like that video talked about. She lost her mother and father. Her cousin Mordecai raises her in this environment. And she, of all people, could have asked God why. Basically, she was a, 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 a trafficked girl in the Jewish community and simply paraded around as a prize for the king. Horrible, horrible circumstances. She went through so many wickedness that no young woman should ever have to go through. And then on top of all that, the racism and the hatred that Haman had and that the king trusted him and moved forward. Look at chapter number 3, verses 13 to 15. The, the, the attitude that prevailed in that time as we close this, uh, as we close this up. Chapter number 3, verses 13 through 15. It says, letters were sent by couriers. This is after the, the decree. Letters were sent by couriers to each of the royal provinces telling the officials to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the Jewish people. It, it becomes the law that this race of people gets to be killed. That's what it says. Both the young and the old, the women and the children, and to plunder their possessions on a single day, the 13th day of Adar, uh, the, the 12th month. And it says a copy of the text was issued as law throughout every province. 
distributed to all the people so that they may get ready for that day. The couriers left, spurred on by royal command, and the law was issued in the fortress of Susa. The king, look what the king and, and, and Haman did. It says they sat down to drink while the city of Susa was in confusion. Man, it is absolutely crazy the wickedness that's going on that becomes the law of the land. And let me say this today, no matter what happens in America, no matter what happens in the world in which you live in, the society is wicked because people are wicked. So let's not be overly surprised when wicked people do wicked things. And let's not as the body of Christ and followers of Christ just overreact and turn into doing wickedness at that time also in return for wickedness. It's, it's easy to question why. And guess what? I think it's important to point out. It says that the city of Susa, the people who heard the decree, were confused. They are absolutely left like, what in the world is going on? Why? Why would you have this being done? Why is this happening? Listen, if I'm being honest, I've asked those kinds of questions. It's okay to ask why. And what I would challenge you and hope that we can get from this is even though it may not be immediately found, the why may not be answered even this side of eternity. I pray that God will use the why question in our life to lead us to, to him more closely and to lead us to the good that eventually he wants to make happen throughout that situation. Mordecai said in our opening verse, Maybe, perhaps, you were placed in this royal kingdom for such a time as this. And she says, you know what? I'm going to do it. If I perish, I perish. So let's close it with this. Here's, here's our take home. Okay, God, God has a plan. Okay, I'm part of the plan. Now, how am I going to live up to the moment that God has called me to? And here's our three really quick things. First, seriously seek God. Mordecai did what most godly people will do in times of trouble. He prayed and he fasted. So let's, let's understand this. Without God, you can't live up to the moment that God has called you to. Without a close relationship with God, young people, you can't become what God wants you to become. Choose faith over fear. Esther had a lot of reason to be afraid. The world was wicked and lots of things going on. Listen, there's a lot going on in this world. I don't want to get sick. Nobody wants to get sick. Nobody wants to get sick with the virus that's spreading rapidly and there's no cures and all sorts of unknowns and uncertainties. But through all of it, you go back to school this year, you go and live your life choosing to act in faith, trusting that somehow this is going to work in some way for good in my life, because I'm going to pursue what God wants for me and go out and impact your world for good, regardless. Impact your world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Give all your time, all of your energy, passion, resources, everything that you have into causes you believe in, and the most important one of which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Be gospel-driven. Be gospel-focused. Let the power that is in the gospel change you so that you can go out and change the world. Like we've seen so many people throughout history, one of the cool things that I see in the book of Esther is the power of one person. One person, Mordecai, who chose to give good advice, to, to be fasting and praying, and to seeking God, even though it's not clear in the text, and then one person, Esther, who chose to take courage and follow God and act in faith and not in fear. Let's pray. God, I love you. I thank you so much for this day and for the message that you placed on my heart today and for these people who were here gathered today, God. And I pray you'll help us to seek you no matter what, to, to follow hard after you, God, and what you want from us every day of our lives, God, because the world is wicked and crazy, God, and what it needs is the gospel to change people. I pray you'll use the people here to go out and make a difference in this world. In Jesus' name, amen.
All right. Well, the only announcement that we have is we've got uh, the Y tonight at 6 o'clock. 5.15 is our youth. So thank you for being here today. You are dismissed. You have a great afternoon. We hope to see you tonight. Pastor John is out there on your way out. I'll be up here, and the ushers also have 